Hi, everyone. Um, sorry I couldn't be here in person, but I hope that this will work out for us. Um, let me know if you have any uh, hearing or seeing the slides. So I've kind of partitioned the talk into two parts, the, mainly the um, Illumina post-processing and QC aspects, and then a, just a small brief overview at the end of some of the um, PacBio data processing. Uh, because I know that you guys will be using some type bio data later in the course. So I just wanted to give kind of a high level overview of that, um, but mainly focusing on the Illumina since you guys are running the next instrument there. So an overview of the analysis workflow. Um, there are three main components. The first is RTA or real-time analysis. Uh, this is the software that runs directly on the sequencing instruments and it runs in real time as data is being acquired. And the main um, goals of RTA are to process the images and produce base calls that get streamed to a secondary server for further downstream processing. Uh, the next module is called BCL FastQ. That's a, another Illumina utility that takes the binary base call files get, that get produced by RTA and converts them to FASTQ files with associated quality values. And then you go into secondary analysis, um, which is a much broader um, analysis group. You guys will be learning later on in the course uh, about BaseBase, which is a large suite of applications um, from Illumina available on, on the cloud. Um, to do a wide range of applications, RNA-seq, um, resequencing utilities, chip seq. So I won't go too much into those aspects as you're going to get more in depth later on, but I'll just give you a high level overview of uh, whole genome sequencing um, secondary analysis that is available from Illumina called Isaac. That was just walking through the analysis workflow. And now we're gonna jump into the image processing. So this is a utility called Firecrest. Um, and the main goal here is to take the signal from the clusters and convert to intensities for the four bases, A, C, G, and T. Um, several things have to happen at this stage to convert from the images. Um, most importantly, the clusters need to be mapped. So they need to be registered with a unique X, Y location on each of the images. And background needs to be subtracted from the images and then pixel offsets need to be corrected as well. Um, this happens because there are slight offsets between the optical paths for the AC, G, and T bases, and those images need to be realigned. Oh my. Uh, my slide is not going through correctly. One second. Okay. Um, you guys have been using the NextSeq instrument. Um, on the HiSeq and MySeq instruments, there are two lasers in green and four dyes for A, C, G, and T. So you take four images at each cycle to capture all the data. The NextSeq is working on a two-channel system with the red and green laser and then only two dyes. So there's either a red, a green, a combination of the two dyes, or dark cycle for G. Because of this, template generation occurs over five cycles. And because G is a dark cycle, it's appropriate to make sure that you minimize the number of Gs that you have in the first five cycles so that you can ensure proper registration of the clusters and proper mapping. Because they are dark cycles will not give you the proper signal and information to assign a cluster position. The reason that the cluster detection is happening over multiple cycles is because if there are two clusters close together, neighbor clusters, that are fluorescing the same base in a cycle, you can get overlap between these clusters and it's difficult to resolve them. Whereas if you capture images over several cycles, it's less likely that those clusters are going to continue to fluoresce the same base over multiple cycles. And once they're in different channels, you can more easily resolve the clusters without that overlap. Okay, next we go into the Bustard module. This is um, base calling and quality calibration for the reads. So the files that get streamed 
uh, across from RTA are called BCL files. They're a binary file that contains the base call sequence read and the quality scores. So the goal is to transfer the intensity information that was captured from image processing and convert it to a base call for ACG or T and an associated quality value, taking into account signal to noise ratios uh, mainly. And what you want to do at this phase, the most important corrections that need to be applied are matrix and phasing corrections. The matrix correction is to correct for overlap between the four different dyes, or spectral overlap between the four fluorescent dyes attached to the bases. Um, for the next seek, this actually isn't applied, but for high seek and my seek, it does need to be applied. And then the next correction is called the phasing and pre phasing correction. This correction is because the strands in a growing cluster um, sometimes fall out of phase with each other. So one strand may miss an incorporation, and another strand may incorporate more than one base in a cycle. So if you pre-phase, you jump ahead and incorporate more bases, and it phasing is falling behind. This creates noise in the cluster as the strands get out of phase. So these corrections need to be applied to provide better base qualities. The base qualities that are produced by Illumina um, initially were thought to be a bit overrepresented, so um, not quite in line with the reality of actual base quality, kind of inflated score. So what Illumina has done ha is to apply um, a calibration for the quality scores. They've run multiple runs of a control library called PhiX and mapped them to the back to their reference and looked at actual mismatch or error rates compared to estimated rates. And so they use this information to dial back the quality values and give you a more uh, robust estimate of quality for base. The next thing to do will be once these BCL files have been to your server, you transition into the BCL to FastQ module. So this would happen on your secondary analysis server, and it's going to take those binary files that are produced, and it's going to give you um, FastQ files as an output, and it's going to demultiplex any samples that you may have done with barcoding. This replaces the Cassava pipeline. I don't know if any of you have um, used Illumina in the past, but uh, this was typically done by Cassava that is now being decommissioned. Um, and so BCL to FastQ and some of the other downstream applications, such as Isaac, are taking over those functions. Um, the only reads that get printed to the FastQ files at this point are reads that pass filter. This is a filter that's called the Chastity filter. That is an automated filter uh, applied by Illumina. This looks over the first 25 bases of the run, and it looks at intensity values for each base. And it is basically um, dividing the intensity value of the highest base by the intensity value of the two highest bases. So if you had an intensity of 10 for C um, and an intensity of 10 for A, and those are your two highest intensities, that would be a value of 0.5. And you would actually want that to fail the chastity filter because you would have pretty much equal intensity for two different base calls and you wouldn't have a very confident call there. So what the chastity filter does is it takes that information and it only allows one base over that 25 base pair span to fail that filter. If more than one base um, does not meet that metric of 0 0.6, then the file is deemed as failed and it will not get printed to your output file. And generally, this is um, uh, a result of overlap between closed clusters. So you're getting a signal overlap in noise. You can also split reads by barcode into separate files. You can allow up to two mismatches for your barcode deconvolution. Um, and that is an option that you can set when you run BCL to FastQ. You can be strict and say you don't want any mismatches, or you can allow one or two. Um, and you need to be careful when you choose your barcodes um, to do your run that you will have barcodes that are different enough that allowing two mismatches will not uh, cause barcode collisions and it will cause an error in your um, data processing. 
Optionally, you can trim for adapters. So if you are doing an experiment where you may have sequenced into adapter regions, you can apply trimming with BCL to FASTQ. You mainly need a sample sheet and the BCL to FASTQ utility, and it's a very simple command, um, which I've written here at the bottom of the slide. You invoke BCL to FASTQ, you provide a run folder directory, you provide um, options on whether you want lanes to be split. So for example, on the next Seq 500, you can run four lanes, but it's all the same sample. So if you would prefer to have just one large FASTQ file, as most people do for your sample, you would use the no lane splitting option. And then you can apply your barcode mismatch rules and specify an output directory. And that will be enough to generate the run folder structure and your FASTQ files. So this is an example of a basic sample sheet. Um, it, you provide a flow cell ID, the lane, the sample in each lane, uh, whether or not it's a control, some operator information, and importantly, a sample project. This is what is going to name your subfolders when you create your directory structure, structure for your output files. Um, one thing to note when you're creating the sample sheets, Illumina has a utility called Experiment Manager that will help you uh, create sample sheets so that you can provide the correct index sequences by looking them up, um, and also that you avoid illegal characters because there are certain characters that will not be allowed and will cause the cell to pass Q to um, error out. So the run folder structure does directly come from that sample sheet information. Um, the main structure of the folder is usually a date followed by an underscore, a machine name, a run number, the flow cell ID, and then a subdirectory called data, intensities, base calls. And underneath that is where you're going to start creating your project directories from your sample sheet. And under each of those project directories, you will have barcoded FASTQ files that are derived if you've chosen to use a barcode. Um, and they'll be labeled either with lanes or, as we specified with the no lane splitting option, just one large FASTQ file with all three split by barcode. And so you can have multiple samples underneath each project, and each of those will create a subfolder as specified in your sample sheet. The FASTQ files that will be generated are in a, the following format. They are um, a header line uh, with a preliminary at symbol. And then the header line is delimited by colons. So the first um, section is the instrument name, followed by a run ID number, flow cell ID, a lane number, a tile number. The tiles are just the units of each lane, um, which are segmented for processing. And then the XY coordinate of your cluster. So this is from your initial cluster registration and mapping. Um, followed by the read number, whether or not the read passed filter, so again, that's the chastity filter, and the barcode sequence. The next line in the file will be your sequence read. Uh, this is a poor example of a read that would not have passed filter, it's just all A's. Um, normally, you would have a much more diverse sequence here. The next line is the plus symbol, and that denotes that the following line is going to be your quality scores. So these quality scores are um, encoded in ASCII 2 format. It's an, actually an ASCII 2 plus 33 format, which is a standard FASTQ fast format for Sanger. Um, and so you can just do conversion um, with an ASCII 2 table to get the actual values. The quality scores that are produced are uh, on a FRED scale. So this means uh, a scale in which a value of 20 would mean that there was a 1 in 100 likelihood that the base called at the position was incorrect. Uh, value of 30 would be 1 in 1,000, 41 in 10,000, et cetera. So that's the FRED scale. You will be provided a summary after running BCL to FASTQ. Um, and this is saved in the run folder, so you can access it uh, separately from some of the software that we're going to be talking about um, in a few slides called SAV, which is a utility that you can use a graphical viewer to look at the quality of your run as it's progressing. 
Um, these files are just saved into the run directory folder. And they'll give you a summary of the clusters that have passed filter, the raw clusters that you generated, um, your overall yield, and importantly, um, the lane summary gives you information about your sample split by barcode. So you can determine the percentage of reads in the lane that matched your barcode. So you can look at uh, how well the pool was um, balanced. You can look at the percentage of perfect barcode reads versus one mis mismatch to see how well your barcodes were able to be deconvoluted. And you can see the quality of each subset of reads with Q30 bases, percentage of Q30 bases, so high quality, and a mean quality score. Uh, one important thing to note is that the bottom of this file provides you with top unknown barcodes. So if when you're creating your sample sheet, if you accidentally added an incorrect index that would not be matched, the software will t give you caps of barcodes that are actually identified in the run but were not specified in the sample sheet. So then you can use this information to help you go back and correct any undetermined barcodes. So there are some barcoding considerations for the HiSeq and NextSeq instruments. Uh, because of the registration over two lasers, when you are pooling low complexity, so fewer barcodes, four, five, six barcodes in, on that order, you need to make sure that you balance so that there is signal for both lasers and both colors at each base of your index read. And if you improperly balance barcodes, you're going to find that the registration is going to get affected and your barcodes will not demultiplex as expected. They'll end up with ends and undetermined reads. So if you are thinking about doing barcoding, pooling experiments um, with a few barcodes, you should really pay attention to the signal balance in both couplers. If you're going to use a large pool of barcodes, most likely, just by chance, you're going to end up having at least one barcode with a signal in each channel as you multiplex more deeply. So it becomes less of an issue as you do more. But for low flex multiplexing, you do want to pay attention to this. For the next seek, um, using the two-channel system, at least one non-G base is required in the first two cycles for the index read. So that's something to keep in mind. You don't want a dark side. Moving on from the primary analysis, so now you have your FASTQ files. Um, and what would you typically do for that? Now, in the next few days, you guys are going to be delving very deeply into read alignment, variant calling, um, annotation of variants. So this is really only meant to be a very high level overview of a typical example of a, of a secondary analysis. And this is one of the things that's available from the um, Again, this Isaac alignment and variant calling uh, has taken the place of cassava, which is the previous uh, iteration of the whole genome resequencing uh, utilities. It is composed of an aligner and a variant caller. Um, the aligner works by sorting a reference index by 32 mer, and then using the first 32 base pairs of each sequence read as a seed to look for candidate mappings. So it searches through the reference index to look for uh, potential matches. It then selects the best mapping using three prime low quality and adapter trimming of the read. So it will extend through the end of the read to find the best global alignment. It'll assign alignment scores using the base qualities and the position of the mismatches within the reads. Um, in Illumina data, it's typical to have more mismatches toward the three prime end of your read. You'll have accumulating more noise at that position. Um, so that is taken into account in the assignment of these scores. Um, and then the alignment scores, again, are based on a FRED scale and um, convey the confidence that the read was actually placed at the appropriate location in the genome and would not map from place else. The output from this step is a sorted uh, deduplicated AM file. 
Um, and deduplicated refers to the fact that PCR duplicates, which can introduce artifacts from the initial library prep stage, would be removed. So any reads that had identical outer coordinates would be considered a PCR artifact, a duplicated read, and only one copy, the highest quality copy of that read pair would be retained. Um, the variant caller uh, will call SNPs, small indels, uh, less than 50 bases. Um, it computes the probability of a um, call being non-referenced, and then also computes the probability of the genotype, heterozygous or homozygous, for a non-reference position. Um, several filters get applied for the SNP calling algorithm. Uh, it uses proper pairs of the read alignment data, which means that the reads have aligned in the appropriate orientation and that they are an expected distance apart for the insert size of the library. Um, it also uses mapping quality of the reads, depth of reads, um, reads supporting the variant, um, and strand bias metrics. So if the variant base call is only found on one strand of the reads, then it is likely an artifact. And so that's taken into account for the variant calling quality. Uh, reads also get aligned around small indels um, to help reduce the false positive SNPs that can get generated from misalignment. And the output file is a GVCF output, which is a genome VCF file, variant call format. This is a standard format that's used for variant calls. Again, you'll be using these files much more in the next few days. The GVCF file is um, basically a file that not only prints out variant positions and information about um, genotype and uh, read depth support at each of those positions, but also for positions that were considered to match the reference, you still get a quality score, genotype and quality score, and read depth at those positions as well. So it's not just variance. It basically calls for everything that was mapped the alignment. So a little bit more about Isaac's alignment. Um, it's a several pass alignment system to try to increase the number of reads that are actually able to be mapped. The first round is a single seed alignment. And then that's followed by multi-seed and gapped alignment, which I'll get into in the next couple of slides. These are done to help improve repeat resolution um, using multiple overlapping seeds and trying to anchor into unique data, and also to try to rescue um, orphans. So if one member of a read pair is able to be mapped uniquely to the reference, but its mate pair is not able to be mapped, the aligner will search within a specified um, window size, basically the insert size expected from the library, to try to place that mate appropriately. And then I have a reference for the Isaac paper for additional reading at the bottom. So these are just some schematics for gapped alignment and next multi-season alignment um, and why they can help you cover reads that might not have been mapped in a single seed attempt. So for gapped alignment, if you don't allow a gap to be opened, what will happen is you will search with your first 32 base pair seed and you'll find anchor in the reference, but as you extend through the seed, you will not span an indel properly. And so it will create mismatches as you extend. And typically an aligner will only allow two mismatches in a 32 base pair seed. And if it exceeds that number, it simply will not map the read. If you allow a gap to be opened, then you can appropriately um, extend past the indel and allow the matches to resume past that point. So you'll span and align properly past the point. The um, gaps that can be opened are small, only around 10 base pairs. Um, and the rule is typically that you need to um, um, resolve at least five mismatches downstream in order for a gap to be considered open. For multi-seeded alignment, um, you recover reads because if you first try to um, align the first 32 base pair seed read, but don't find um, 
region where the seed maps appropriately to the reference as of an indel. You can then move down the read to the second 32 base pair seed. So trying a different window of the read and try to anchor uniquely past the indel and then allow the aligner to open a gap to span the indel so that you can now place that read appropriately in the reference. For additional viewing of your data, once you've done alignment and variant calling, often people would like to have a graphical viewer um, available to look at their data in more detail in the context of genomic annotations. Um, and Illumina provides this in the form of Genome Studio, which is a um, Windows application that you can uh, purchase from Illumina. It'll provide um, graphical information about coverage and SNPs, as well as allowing you to scan within genomic annotation contexts and look at um, variant calls and your line data um, and delve more deeply into it visually. Um, Illumina also offers something called Variant Studio. Uh, this is a user interface that allows you to import your VCF files, so um, your variant calls, and then annotate them um, using RefSeq annotations to see whether your variants are falling in coding regions, and if so whether the, they cause a missense or nonsense change, uh, whether indels will cause a frame shift, et cetera. Um, you can also um, filter by different databases um, in terms of uh, population frequencies, so 1,000 genomes or Exxon Variant Server public databases, FSAC database from the road uh, to look for allele frequencies for rare variants. And you can classify variants with tools like SIFT and Polyfen to try to predict deleterious um, non-synonymous changes that might affect protein. Uh, this would also let you filter based on a family structure, if you could looking at a trio data or a pedigree. Um, and a d disease model, a dominant or recessive disease model. Um, and if you're doing cancer work, you look at uh, somatic variants and cosmic database. And many reports and histograms will be generated for you with this variant studio application. So it's an option that's out there. Certainly, there are many other options, and you guys are going to actually be learning about many of them. Um, many which were written by the instructors of the course, actually, in the next few days um, to do these very same um, annotation and analysis. Okay, so that's kind of the overview of a workflow from primary data processing and how you would go into secondary data processing. Now I'm going to switch more into the aspects of the data. So the main um, tool that Illumina provides is called SAV, Sequence Analysis Viewer. And this is a nice graphical interface that gives you graphs um, to look at quality values, um, look at how uh, the run performs over time, um, and look at general statistics for intensities and many different metrics. This is a, the main screen, and there are several different charts that you can look at. Um, this analysis tab shows you the flow cell chart on the left panel in which there are um, these long segmented lines represent each lane of a flow cell. And you can look at intensity um, for either surface of the flow cell, particular cycles of the flow cell. Uh, you can limit to just one base. And these drop down menus allow you to toggle between different values so that you can look across the flow cell. What you would see in the instance of this screenshot is that lane one, in this case, is showing much lower intensity than the other lanes. So the flow cell chart is a nice heat map type of approach that you look for large scale issues in the sequencing. Uh, this might be a problem with reagent flow or the camera not imaging properly at this point. And so this is a, a broad overview of how things are going and you can catch things rather quickly. Um, the middle panel is the data by cycle panel. Again, you can toggle uh, for different values. You can look at different lanes, different surfaces, um, each base individually. 
And you can look at different metrics from intensity to quality values. Um, this intensity pool basically shows you uh, for each cycle the A, C, G, and T intensities that were reported. And so you could see if you had um, a sample that had a bias base composition, you would be able to tell at which cycles that was occurring, and that might actually affect your quality values for the run because the optics do prefer, um, in terms of cluster registration, that you have intensity in your channels in a balanced fashion. The panel to the right is a Q-score distribution. Um, and so this is basically you want to see the peak of your values to be to the right of this chart um, with higher Q-scores in the 30 to 40 range. And your percentage of Q30 bases for the run you would want to be quite a bit higher. This would be a poor um, Q30 percentage for this lane. And that would be obvious from the intensity issues that you can see on the flow cell panel. Something is going wrong here. Um, the panel in the middle bottom is called data by lane. This shows you the cluster density, the raw density, and the filtered density. The box plot shows you raw, and the green shows you um, the, after the chastity. And if there's a big difference between those two box plots, that typically shows you that you've got a lot of failures in your lane. There's um, a quality issue there to be addressed. You want to see a pretty tight correlation of those raw and filtered. And then you just have a heat map view of the quality scores, just a different way to view by cycle for each link. So one important thing to do when you're trying to QC is to check images. So there are thumbnail images, uh, small snapshots that get saved as the run is progressing. And typically, when you see an issue, like we just saw with lane one, where you were seeing a drop in intensity, you'd want to go and check the images just to see if the camera has gone out of focus, or if there is something um, blocking the focus, um, and try to determine what's going on with the run. Uh, this is the SAV summary. So this gives you an overall summary of the run as it's completed. Um, it gives you your total yield, so you get an idea of the estimate of your run output. Um, and then it gives you uh, summaries by read for each experiment. So if you look across the values for the read one um, summary report, you find the lane, the number of tiles that were analyzed, the density for that lane. So typically in a high seq flow cell, we would shoot for around 885 um, k per millimeter squared for a typical cluster density, um, so that you maximize your yield without losing data to um, an overly dense flow cell that you can't register clusters properly. For the percentage of clusters that pass filter, what you see here would be um, greater than 80%, and typically on a really good run, greater than 85% of the clusters passing filter. Um, the phasing and pre-phasing values, you typically want to see below 0.5 here. When those values rise, it's typically an indication of a flow problem um, or reagent issue. Um, then you will get your read output um, raw and filtered. You'll get the percentage of Q30 bases for your lane. Again, in a good run, you'd want to see this being above 80%. And then you get alignment statistics. So these statistics are automatically generated if you spike in a PHIX control library to your sample. So this is often something that we'll do for QC purposes um, using just a small amount, about 2% of a PHIX control library. It's a standardized library that you can align to the reference and look at error rates across um, the cycles of the run. And so you can see error rates at 35 cycles, 75 cycles, and all the way through the end of the read. So you can see how errors are accumulating as you're um, going through incorporations. And typically, you'd want to see those error rates being less than 1%. Um, and then you have the intensity panels. And generally, you want to see higher intensities are better. And you would like to see intensity being retained um, over the cycles. Uh, the lasers do get a um, bump in intensity uh, as the run progresses to try to um, accommodate typical signal loss as the run is 
something due to signal to noise increasing. So you will see that in some of the following graphs, the intensity does get bumped up um, by the instrument, but you just don't want to see a great loss in uh, intensity. So this is an example of using the data by cycle to check your quality scores and look at the evolution of your run over time. Um, so the top panel shows you a good run where um, read one and read two both stay within a really high quality uh, above 80% Q30 as you progress through the read. And although the three prime, prime end does um, tail off a little bit in quality, you don't see any major drops. The panel below shows you uh, an issue that you would have noticed a problem in your Basically, read one, the quality values drop off rather extremely in the middle of the read, and then it seems to recover uh, by the uh, beginning of the read two. So something happened possibly with flow um, or imaging of this uh, sequencing run or an issue with the construction of the sequencing library. So these are just ways that you can troubleshoot to see what's going on with your run and try to pick up uh, problems as they're occurring. So this is a, an example of the intensity graph and how it reflects in the error rates and um, the Q30 um, data. So when you have uneven base composition, this really affects the quality of the registration and the base calling. And so that will also affect the error rates, quality values of the reads that you're going to produce. And so you can often see that correlation with the intensity charts showing on the top panel um, in read two, the error rates really increasing. Um, and then on the panel on the bottom, um, a nicely balanced run on read two, but errors in read one, where there's a stretch of cases that are well balanced. So there's some sequence effects there. Uh, this is an example of using the flow cell chart to detect um, a problem with the flow cell itself. So this show, panel shows that lane four was showing a uh, significant intensity drop. And if you look at the thumbnail images here, what you can see is that the oligo lawn of the flow cell actually got stripped. So that is the uh, flow cell defect that's affecting the quality of the run there. Uh, one other thing that you can do with the addition of the PhiX library, so in addition to providing a control metric that allows you to get um, alignment statistics from RTA, um, you can also use uh, a larger percentage of a PhiX um, spike in, in your library to help alleviate the problems with unbalanced signal. So often a 25% or 30% spike in of PhiX, if you have a really unbalanced library, might help with the so the registration issues that often um, produce lower quality data. So that's one thing that you can do. Um, another nice reason to sometimes have uh, some amount of PIX spiked into your library is if you have a hybridization problem. So if a user accidentally asks you to use the wrong sequencing primer and you go and look at the images, um, you can see that very sparse few clusters seem to have primed and those would potentially be just the phi x spike in that is working. So the, the primer is actually incorrect. So now moving away from SAV, if you don't have access to um, SAV, if you're simply getting FASTQ files as a, an output for Illumina data processing that you're doing, um, what can you do to assess the quality of that data? And there are several pieces of um, software that will allow you to do that. One very popular one is called FastQC um, from the Babraham Institute. And this allows you to um, download a tool that will assess a FastQ file and provide you with charts and metrics on whether you have good base quality across the run, GC content, and other things. If you want to actually do manipulation of your files, if you look at your files and you find that perhaps there's low quality on the free prime end or there's some adapter contamination and you want to be able to trim um, and manipulate those files, there are also tools available for that. Um, one is the FastX Toolkit, um, which is from the Hannon Lab here at Cold Spring Harbor. 
And another is uh, Seek TK, which is from uh, Hang Lee. And um, there are also additional tools. One that comes to mind is Cut Adapt. Um, sorry to escape me the lab that that is from. But there are multiple tools out there for this. Uh, and typically, these kits are pretty easy to implement and really um, useful in terms of being able to trim your data so that you can get a maximum output from your downstream environment in Baron Con. So I wanted to do an example. Um, this comes right from the training site for FastQC of what you would see um, when you upload your data. So this is the, the type of report that would be generated when you would um, input a FastQ file. This is a, showing a very nice, high quality um, Illumina short read uh, report. So you can look at things such as the per base sequence quality. So this is very similar to what you can do with SAV, but if you don't have access to that, um, this is a nice way to look at a box plot across the read, making sure you don't have a drop off on the free time end, as we discussed. Um, you can look at uh, sequence content, um, quality scores, uh, GC content, so if you are worried about any bias in your library in terms of GC content, you can assess that. And basically, this report will provide you with these graphs and metrics and um, color coding, basically green with a check mark means that it's okay. Um, orange with an exclamation point is a warning, so you'll set a level um, at which you'll call something a warning. So for example, if you had perhaps 10% of the data showing uh, adapter sequence matches, you would get a warning. And then if it was 20% of the data, uh, you would get basically a red X saying that there was uh, a main issue to be addressed. So you can look in the documentation to see what those metrics and thresholds are for deeming something OK or problematic. And then you can adjust that depending on the expectations of your library. Um, but just so you get an idea, you can look at sequence duplication if you were to have a lot of PCR duplicates, um, adapter content, um, overrepresented k-mers. So if you had some bias where you're seeing uh, the same short sequences uh, over and over, more than expected in the library, you can assess all of that. So that's a nice tool um, that's available, and then. This is just a link to uh, something that looks actually bad. Um, so here you can see in the per sequence quality plot right away, the box plots are really dropping off toward the three prime end of the run. So this is an, a case where this could help guide you in um, where you would want to trim your data um, and set your cutoffs for your downstream processing. OK, so now I was just going to um, do a really brief, I think I'm running over time here, um, overview of the PACO data analysis, unless there are questions about the Illumina portion. No? OK. Um, so specific biosciences uh, data analysis suite um, begins with primary analysis. And this is what's happening actually on the instrument. Uh, the RS2 instrument itself. And this is described as the real-time conversion of photon counts versus time to matrix. So this is basic signal processing that's happening at this point. Um, converting the movies to um, base calls over several different steps. So initially, you'll need to do ZMD, ZMW gridding, um, an estimation of the photon count per pixel, and spectral calibration. So again, we're talking about the four fluorescent dyes for ACG and T. Um, then in the, it's called the trace to pulse section, you're gonna start doing peak detection and kinetics of the base incorporation. So you're gonna look at intensity of the base fall, um, duration, distance to the next peak, and sequence context. So basically the bases that are being called around the peak. For base calling, you're going to um, do the pulse to base um, conversion, where you're going to find all possible base calls and pick the best call. 
with the quality information that's available, and also model whether a call might be an insertion or deletion based on um, kinetics information again. So uh, the interpulse distance, alteration, uh, those types of things to try to assess whether a call is actually an insertion or deletion. Um, you'll do adapter screening at this phase, and you'll assign quality scores. So you can use a single sum quality score, or you can do quality values by type for a substitution or mismatch, an insertion or deletion. And the, the data files for Pacific Biosciences are um, a binary HDF5 format, which is like a container or directory format. And it allows you to um, save and record a lot more rich information than just a single base call and quality score. So you can have multiple quality values, you can have kinetic information, interpulse distance, um, those types of things saved within this file that can be uh, retrieved. And so this processing is happening for the 150,000 ZMWs on the smart cell. And then for the secondary analysis, um, you have two options. You have what's called smart pipe, which is the command line access, and the smart portal, which is the web-based um, user interface that's really uh, user-friendly. And they're not mutually exclusive. Um, you can have both up and running, uh, available for people uh, who have different needs and bioinformatics expertise. There are uh, quite a few smart analysis applications. Again, you're going to be doing um, some assembly work with PacBio data later in the course with instructors. And so I'm just merely giving you a, a very high level overview here of some of the um, applications that are available and there are a wide range of things that you can do. So initially what you can do um, is the filtering step. You can filter the, the data for quality um, and for minimum uh, read length. And you can also split it by barcode. Um, you can perform alignment with a tool called Blazor. So this is PacBio's um, alignment tool it's been tailored to suit the um, longer read lengths, variable read lengths that you can get from PacBio, as well as the different error profile from PacBio reads. So um, they're dominated by insertions and deletions uh, rather than substitutions. So the aligner is taking that all into account. Uh, same thing for the consensus invariant calling. They have a method called Quiver, again, tuned to a particular data type. Um, you can do de novo assembly or hybrid assembly. There are tools called HGAP for de novo assembly or AHA, which is a um, scaffolding hybrid assembler or then pack bio long read data. Um, and then there are multiple applications for base modifications, methylation, uh, amplicon analysis, and RNA sequencing. So looking at different spice isoforms for RNA seq data. Um, the smart portal is uh, one of the easiest ways to really access the initial uh, quality information for the run and get a, a quick view. So the portal is um, quite easy to navigate. There are options to design a new job. If you want to start an analysis of uh, reads that are streamed over from the RS to, to a secondary server and stored there, you can simply import them and um, uh, design your job for any downstream application that you want to do from simply filtering and exporting FastQ files to anything downstream. Um, and this allows you to import smart cells. Um, I'm sorry, did somebody ask? OK, sorry, must have been feedback. Um, import smart cells, um, import reference sequences, um, and manage uh, data, monitor jobs that are running, and view data for jobs that have already been processed. Uh, the first step would be to import your data. So you save your smart cells, your primary data that is streamed over from the instrument, um, which contains the HD5 files in a data on your server, a directory on your server, um, and you simply provide the path to that data. The data will be imported into the portal, and then you provide a reference sequence. That sequence will get indexed for downstream alignment. Um, 
if you choose to use any of the Blazor or other alignment uh, protocols. And then you'll get an email sent back to you when your reference index is ready and uh, you can go ahead and start your jobs. Uh, typically, you would just click on the design job tab and create a job name, add any comments that you wanted, um, and then select a protocol. So PECBio has provided protocols here um, for typical use cases. These protocols are all saved on the server, and you can modify uh, protocols and customize protocols to create your own. Um, but you can also use the command line smart pipe tools if you wanted to do any of this analysis. Um, they will allow you to have um, much more control over the options that you want to use for your analysis. So often command line tools are uh, a better choice. But you are actually able through Smart Portal to do a bit of configuring for the, the, the uh, application that you want to run. So you can choose from any of the following um, applications in the pull down menu from a typical resequencing protocol, which would be aligning to a reference and calling variants to a um, de novo assembly or uh, Amplicon analysis or a simple what's called a reads of insert um, analysis. So reads of insert has um, taken the place of what used to be called CCS or circular consensus. It's basically providing you with a consensus read, one consensus for each CMW um, of reads that have sequenced through the adapter on both sides, so a full pass of your insert. And you can specify how many passes you require for a read of insert to be um, printed, uh, anywhere from one to three, depending on how uh, many passes you want to require to try to increase your read accuracy. And since the errors are random in PacBio data, doing more and more passes should allow you to have a higher accuracy uh, read consensus. So you would simply pick the smart cells that you wanted to analyze from the list in the panel on the left, um, choose a reference sequence and your protocol, and hit start. The job would be submitted to the cluster using the templates um, that PacBio has provided, and you would be able to follow along with the progress of the job and uh, view any logs as the run progressed. So as I was saying, you can um, configure these jobs in Smart Portal by clicking on the protocol. You get a little bit of a description of what the protocol is doing. So for the reads of insert um, mapping protocol, you're going to generate a consensus sequence and then map to a reference. And so for each of the um, .xml protocols that you see here, you can do a little bit of um, configuring by clicking on the panel. Um, and in this case, for reads of insert, you can specify the number of passes that you want to uh, create a consensus for each interview. Once the job is done, you would get a um, report with many nice graphs to help you assess the quality of your run. Um, you get overview statistics, um, which would show you whether you had adapter dimers contaminating the library or short inserts. You get an overall total of the number of bases. You get an N50 read length, which means that 50% um, of the reads generated would be at this length better. Um, and then you get statistics for the polymerase read length, um, sub-read length, and reads of insert. So polymerase reads will show you the ability of the sequencer, how long it was able to sequence going around and around the templates. Reads of insert will give you the maximum length of your insert library as you're looking between the adapters from one to the other. And then subreads will give you any of the reads that are formed, whether you make it all the way around the smart cell or not. So any short read that's formed as you're going along with that. You can look at um, the filtering statistics. So you can filter, again, for the a minimum read length of, say, 50 bases and minimum quality, typically, of around 70 bases. Um, you, on a single pass, pack file run, you're looking at about 83 to 85% accuracy. Um, and then if you're doing reads of insert with additional passes, you should be up more around 99% uh, accuracy as you accumulate coverage. 
So according to the protocol that you've done, if you've done a short read library or a long read library, you can look at your mapped read lengths, um, concordance to the reference. Um, reads of insert can show you how well you've done on, say, a large insert library, um, if you're achieving the insert sizes that you are trying to select, or if you have actually shorter inserts that are sequencing, potentially. And you can look at depth of coverage across your reference and call variance and many of the things we've discussed with the illuminative of data is similar uh, things you can check here. So if you zoom in on just one of those um, regions here, this is the mapped subread, you get these graphs that will show you, um, you know, the range of the data quality that you've achieved when you map back to the reference, the error rates are going to look like for your reads, and a distribution of your read lengths. Um, the bottom panel, the bottom panel shows you loading. Uh, ZMW loading productivity. So typically for a good run, you'd want at least 30 to 40 percent um, ZMW productivity one, which means that you have one template in the ZMW. Um, zero means that there was not proper loading, and two which means there's more than one template. So you can keep an eye on how well uh, your loading and subsequent yield will be for the run. And then PacBio has a tool called SmartView that will allow you to visualize your data so you can look at the aligned reads um, and any variance that you called against a reference um, with color coding for different types of calls, insertions, deletions, substitutions, um, color coding for alignment quality reads. And you can zoom in um, to a base level and look at the data at each position, um, which reads are calling, which bases, um, overall coverage and consensus of qualities and other typical viewer statistics. So that was all I really had, um, just as a quick overview. Are there any questions for either section? you'll get an error. So when you're doing the BCL conversion, you'll get an error and it will report to you that there are barcode collisions and the barcodes are too close to allow two mismatches. And then you could restart the run allowing one or zero mismatches to see which will work. Sure. Oh, OK. Um, well, I mean, some of that comes from experience. But basically, what you would want to see, so let me go back to one. Um, so here's one example of an image. What you would want to see on these images would be um, a more densely packed lawn of clusters that are sharply in focus. Um, and no blurriness or fuzziness across the image. Um, you would not want to see, so in this case, you just see basically blank cells, okay? So there was no primer lawn on this um, lane, and so no clusters formed at all. So you want to see, you know, sharply in focus, bright clusters. You want to see a reasonable density, because if you get a really high density on a flow cell, what you'll start to see is the images will be extremely bright so that you really can't discern anything. Um, it's just overloaded with signal. No, it's, these, are, these are troubleshooting. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yes.
how common is it that we look at the, the image snapshots? Yes. Um, honestly, whenever we see an issue um, on the flow cell map, we'll start looking into the quality values and then start delving into some snapshots. Because it's really the quickest way, if you're going to call Illumina tech support, to try to um, give them information about what you're seeing and what you think the possible culprits are. I mean, they're going to collect information from you to try to, you know, help you troubleshoot the run as well. But that's really one of the frontline um, things to check, is to see what's going on in terms of imaging. Because you do have issues with cameras going out of focus. Um, you do have float problems. Um, sometimes you'll see bubbles um, in an image. So you'll know that there was an issue with reagent flow, and you can see the actual bubbles captured on the images. So you, you use the flow cell map to try to guide you to where the issue is. So in looking at the tiles and the, the segments of the lane of where you're trying to see the problem. So you can kind of quickly scan through and just click several different um, images across the tiles, and you'll start to see a pattern. But yeah, I mean, you're not going to go through necessarily one by one by one. Um, usually it's a, it's a larger scale problem that you can catch by clicking through some of the images from the, you know, the middle of the float cell or the, the top or the bottom. You can see it in a region. So if you, you can download the software. Um, but if you don't have access to the server where some of these files are being stored, you would have to ask for the interop files. So there's a folder um, under the run folder called interop, and that's where these files get stored. So if you were working with like a core facility or something, you'd have to ask them to give you those. Typically, people wouldn't give you those. They would give you more of the flat reports that I showed, kind of that summary report. Um, but if you did want to look at this, or maybe screen, you can also do screenshots um, from SAV, so you could request that from them. But if you wanted more interactive viewing of, of using SAV yourself, you would need to interrupt files. Great. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the course. Thank you. Have a good time. You too.